Kelly here with the KCK Chamber of Commerce. I want to welcome you all to our second uh, edition of our Women's Chamber Network, our February edition uh, event. I want to give a quick thanks to all of our sponsors who help support uh, this women's division here at the Chamber. They're listed on the slide. As you can see, we have tremendous support from our corporate partners, uh, not just for the Chamber, but also specifically for programming for women in business. We cannot be more excited and prouder of uh, having this division here at the chamber. And you know, we've got a great committee that puts, on, puts in a lot of work to ensure great programming uh, for women in business. So whether it's top level executives, mid managers, young professionals, hopefully you'll find that throughout the year we'll have some really great speakers and opportunities for women in business to connect. We also wanna encourage everyone on the call you know, especially for you women in business to, to know that uh, it's not just about the Women's Chamber Network. You, we want you all to participate across the board with all of our programming. So whether it's public policy or community impact or small business, uh, please know that we want you to get engaged at every level. Um, and at this point, I'd like to introduce the chair of our Women's Chamber Network, Kathy Harding, who is also uh, with, with our board of directors and is the CEO of the Wyandotte Health Foundation. Kathy? Uh, yes, thank you, Daniel, and welcome, everybody, and um, just would like to thank the program committee. Patrice Townsend chairs that, um, and they're, they're pulling together an outstanding list of events that are going to be scheduled throughout the year, so please continue to check the, the website for the KCK Chamber to see what upcoming events there are. Um, it's, it's going to be really exciting, and in fact, before I introduce Karen Orr from Providence, I would like to turn this over to Dr. Tammy Bartunek to talk a little bit about our March program that's coming up. So Tammy. Hi, thanks Kathy. Good morning or no, good afternoon now everybody. I'm so glad to see so many faces and I am super excited for our March program. It'll be March the 24th. It will be a lunchtime. Um, I like to call them lunch and learns and it's going to feature um, Nicole Bianchi. Um, she will be speaking to us about bravership and this is the title of her new book, which is launching this, um, this spring. And in a nutshell, she's gonna talk to us about what can we do today? What can all of us do today, an actionable step that is brave, that will help us get to where we want to be next. So it's all about embracing what scares us and turning those into real actions. So um, I'm super excited. And on a personal note, I have known um, Nicole, I used to call her Nikki, you know, back in the day since high school. Um, so she's just a fantastic person. I can vouch for her. And she's developed her HR company and she does mentoring and professional coaching. She, she is a certified um, coach. So I think she will really have a lot of good insights for us. So Thanks, Kathy, for letting me have that time, and I hope you all can join us. Thank you, Tammy. So anyway, mark your calendars now. Noon on March 24th. It's going to be an excellent program. And with that, I do want to thank Providence Medical Center for hosting our program today. And I will turn it over now to Karen Orr, who is the CEO at Providence Medical Center, to introduce our program. Karen? Thanks, Kathy. I appreciate it. Um, it's good to uh, see everyone. I have to be um, completely honest. Um, many of you know me, and, and we've been happy to host this for the last several years. And um, when I was asked to kind of introduce our speaker, Dr. Katrapati, today, I said, all right, they're going to have that awesome salad. And then I was really disappointed that we're not going to get that awesome salad that we have every year. You know the one I'm talking about with the strawberries on it. It is so good. Um, so we're going to have hoagie sandwiches in the boardroom instead, and that's okay. I guess I'm going to get food, but, um, you know, like most everyone, I'm sure on the call, this has been a wild last year and, um, a year ago when we all, uh, were here together at Providence, I never would have thought that we'd all go through what we did. Um, life is good at Providence. Uh, we have, um, so far we have treated, uh, we've taken care of 550 inpatient COVID patients. Um, 127 employees have had COVID and been out. Um, we have um, in, that, in those figures, we have uh, lost 125 patients. Um, and sadly we did lose one employee, but um, we were uh, 
Dance and Happy Dances this morning. Today is our lowest COVID numbers that we've had since March 13th of last year. So uh, we had reason to celebrate today. Yeah, no kidding. We had reason to celebrate. So we have eight patients in the building with COVID today. Um, and uh, I, we just need to keep going in that direction. Uh, vaccine clinics are going very well. Uh, we've gotten about 60% of our Providence and St. John employees vaccinated so far. Um, I, you know, went through it. I, you're going to hear lots about side effects and scary, and um, it's okay. I had a little bit of side effects, but totally worth it. Uh, 12 hours later, I was fine and feeling great, and um, it feels good to be vaccinated and, you know, to think that we're at least headed that, headed that down that right direction. Um, we've given about 800 vaccines so far. Um, I wish we had thousands and thousands more to give. I'm really, really hoping that uh, we start getting opening up on kind of the allocation so we can really start getting communities vaccinated. So um, it's safe, we're good here. Uh, we, we feel normal for the most part. Um, so we'll look forward to seeing everybody back here soon. And I think with that, I will introduce Dr. Katrapati, who uh, those of you that were here last year at Providence eating the yummy salad know Dr. Katrapati and some of our cath lab staff has joined us. Um, so here we go, without further ado, Dr. Katrapati and... Start video, okay, great. Hi everybody, thanks for uh, joining me this afternoon. Uh, good afternoon to everybody. Um, appreciate the opportunity to speak with you all again. Um, I see some familiar faces. Caitlin and Kathy, uh, how are you guys? So um, I hope you guys can see my slide. Let me just pull it up here and we'll get started. Um, I'm hoping this is gonna be as interactive as possible. Um, okay. Let me click on it. Do you guys see the full slide or just the... Yeah, doctor, you might have to adjust your display settings um, yep. so you can get the full slide up. Let me try to do that here. It's, it's advancing. There we go. Let me just put this on. It's much easier in person, isn't it? How does that look? Can't see anything. How about there? No. No, all I can see are the people who are attending. Okay. Doctor, you might have to reshare your slide. Sometimes that happens when you exit out. Sure. How about that, Kaylin? That's perfect. Okay, great. All right, guys. Wonderful. Micah was almost having a heart attack over here. <laughs> this, this thing works. So <laughs> we got, um, so I'm Dr. Kachapati. For those of you that guys that don't know me, uh, I'm a cardiologist here at Providence Medical Center. I've been here for about five years. Uh, I've had the privilege of taking care of, uh, you know, many patients in the community. Um, and uh, again, tr truly uh, happy to be here. I want this to be as interactive as possible. I want you guys to ask questions. So I only have about 10, 15 slides here. They kind of run through some basics of, of heart disease and, and uh, a slide or two on COVID. Uh, and then we can kind of uh, open up the floor for questions because I think that's kind of where everybody learns. So, um, you know, my word of the day is moderation. Uh, I think uh, I truly believe in that, whether it comes to, you know, health or just life in general, uh, extremes of, of one or the other are, are bad news. Uh, and so uh, you'll kind of get an understanding of why I, I picked this word uh, for the talk today. Um, so, you know, the spectrum of coronary disease, as, as you all know, uh, heart disease doesn't happen overnight. 
Uh, you probably have had family members or, or, or friends or, or others where you see that, you know, they said, hey, I went to my cardiologist, you know, last week or a week ago, or I had a stress test last year and everything was fine. And then, you know, a few weeks or months later, you end up having a heart attack. Um, and that's because no test is perfect. And, and what's happening underneath the iceberg, so to speak, or, or underneath the, you know, uh, the road is that people have many, many risk factors, whether that may be hypertension or cholesterol, et cetera. And what that does over time uh, is it starts to affect the inner lining, which is the endothelium. That's the inner lining of the heart uh, of blood vessels. And when those things start getting affected, that's when plaque forms. So I tell people, this is kind of similar to when a new road is paved and you know, uh, over the next several years because of ice and salt and rock and trucks and whatever else, those that road starts to get potholes. So the analogy in the heart is, you know, the, the rice, the, the salt and ice and all those kinds of things, that's diabetes, that's smoking, that's lack of exercise, you know, that's cholesterol problems, that's genetics, family history, you know, all those risk factors come together and ultimately lead to, you know, a blood clot forming, whether it's in the form of a heart attack or, or you know, cardiac arrest, et cetera. Um, you know, I've been privileged to take care of many of these patients. Uh, you know, a heart attack is a big deal for a lot of people and for families. And we tell, you know, patients that if you have chest pain, I think it's one thing you can take away, take away from this talk. If any of you or any of your family members or friends, you know, hopefully you don't have to experience this, but if they have real chest pain, please call 911. You know, I have family members driving others and I tell them, you know, you can't do CPR while you're driving the car. So it's not to scare anybody, but it's more of a public health and safety, you know, information is, is true chest pain, please call 911. I know people are worried about cost of, of ambulances, et cetera, but please call 911 and, and they'll, bring, they'll bring you to the right place. Um, so this, this spectrum of disease that, that starts with risk factors and, you know, leads to, you know, end stage heart disease, like I said, that happens over several years for most people. Uh, and, and the hope is that when we control the upstream things like high blood pressure and cholesterol, uh, that you hopefully prevent the downstream problems like a heart attack. And please stop me if you guys have any questions, please unmute yourself and just, you know, question and ask questions. I, I think um, this is a very important slide from my perspective as to why we can't predict when someone's going to have a heart attack. Uh, and the reason is this. As you can see here, this shows you a normal vessel. You know, that's the size of a normal vessel. And when you first start getting plaque, whether it's in, you know, however old you might be, 50s, 60s, um, it, it, the plaque kind of forms on the outside of the vessel. You can see that the lumen or the inner, inner part of the vessel is still the same size as it was before. Even when you get moderate blockages, uh, the, the vessel still kind of is able to compensate because most of the plaque is building up on the outside of the pipe. But that when you get to severe blockages is kind of when you start people experiencing, you know, chest pain, shortness of breath, and those kinds of changes. So, you know, going from here, you know, where it's normal to here, where it's severe coronary artery disease takes several years. Um, and, you know, patients always ask me, hey, if I stop smoking, am I going to be okay now after they smoke for 60 years? And I tell them, no, it's, it's a little, you know, too little too late, but the hope is to prevent a next heart attack. I can never reverse this. You know, th there's very little evidence to show that medications or lifestyle changes in your 60s uh, is going to reverse this chronic process that's happened for several decades. Uh, but the medications can prevent a, a future heart attack or a stroke. Uh, and so that's the reason why we tell people, you know, you got to start early, exercise early, take care of yourself early. Um, uh, as I heard in the introduction, uh, uh, you know, there's uh, executive is, executives and young business professionals. So even if you're in your 20s and 30s, you know, this plaque formation starts, you know, when, when we are quite young. Uh, so it's important to prevent the progression to severe coronary disease. And this is also one of the reasons why stress tests aren't perfect in the sense that they can't pick things up. Stress tests only pick up blockages that are more than 70 or 80 percent. So don't lull yourself into, you know, a safety thinking that, oh, I had a normal stress test last year. I can keep smoking or, or I can, you know, eat whatever I want. Uh, the reason is the stress test won't pick up this moderate blockage. And it's these moderate blockages over time that become severe blockages. So important to have that discussion with your doctor that even though you might have a negative stress test, if you have risk factors, it's important to control those risk factors. Um, always important to kind of talk about common heart attack warning signs. Uh, you guys all know this, but I, I just like to reiterate this because people tend to forget this. Um, 
you know, common heart attack warning signs, pain or discomfort in the chest. You know, as I said, don't ignore it. Please speak up. I have a link in there to a YouTube video done by Elizabeth Banks uh, a while back. I hope it plays your, and if it doesn't, you guys can just Google it offline. Uh, it's on YouTube. You can just type in Elizabeth Banks, you know, heart attack video. It just kind of goes to show you how people, you know, um, basically ignore real symptoms, uh, don't pay attention, kind of think that it's something else, or basically in denial. So we want to make sure that everybody avoids that, especially this day and age when people are scared to come to the hospital. Uh, we have seen, unfortunately, a significant drop in patients coming in for heart attacks and strokes nationally, not just in Providence, but nationally, because they're worried about getting COVID in the hospital. Um, so the message out there should be is if you have real pain, real symptoms, you know, for a stroke or heart attack or any other major problem, please seek medical attention immediately. So pain or discomfort in the chest, lightheadedness and nausea and vomiting, you know, a lot of that heartburn symptoms that people tend to have uh, could be a sign. Not every heartburn is a heart attack, but, but certainly if it's not getting better with Tums, it's getting worse, you know, over several days, something to seek medical attention for, jaw or neck or back pain, um, and then certainly shortness of breath, you know, something to pay attention to. Um, I always emphasize this to, to this group of, of participants, you know, women tend to ignore a lot of signs and, and try to focus on, you know, other, every, everything else in life, whether it's their business or family. Um, and, and the key is not to ignore those symptoms. Fatigue, you know, if you're able to run your business and, and you're able to do all the work, you're able to clean the store and, and get home and, and do all the work you had to do at home, but now you can barely clean the store and, and things are, you know, you're more and more short of breath. Well, those should be warning signs not to be ignored. You're not just getting older. There may be something going on. So, Caitlin, you can hear me okay? Yeah, okay. All right, great. So, um, things that are in your control and things you can't control. Um, you know, I heard about the next speaker you're going to have next month, um, you know, about uh, what you can do today uh, to help yourself tomorrow. Um, certainly, you can't control how old you are. You can't control, you know, your family history or your genetics. Uh, but the things on the left side of the screen, you know, diet, exercise, smoking, high blood pressure and high cholesterol, five key things that are very uh, easy to control. And I think out of all of these things, um, I would say diet is the number one thing I think most people falter on. Um, not everybody, but most people. And, and I think that's where we as a nation and as a community in Kansas City have, have a chance to, you know, kind of really shift the paradigm in, in heart disease is by changing, changing diet. Um, because I tell my patients, uh, you guys have heard me say this before, you can't outrun a cookie. And, and what I mean by that is a cookie the size of my palm is about two, 300 calories. Um, don't please, please ignore that pudding I have in the back there. Okay? Uh, I hope you, I hope you guys can't see that, but, but, um, you know, a cookie the size of my palm is two, 300 calories and, and, and to exercise that off, you know, an average size person probably has to run or walk on the treadmill for 20, 30 minutes. Um, and so I think that's where the biggest impact we can make is, and I'll go over some diet data here in a second. Um, so risk factors, things for you guys to maybe think about and talk with your physician. I know a lot of patients and, and folks, especially this past year, have not, you know, gone to their regular primary care visits. Um, you know, family history of coronary disease, if you had truly do have members in your family who below the age of 55 have had heart disease, important to talk with your physician about, you know, hey, what is my risk? How can I mitigate that risk? Um, cholesterol, I just have some numbers up there for you. You know, cholesterol that, if your LDL cholesterol, quote unquote, your bad cholesterol, uh, if it's above 100, really, uh, you know, you have a higher risk in the long term. Uh, as I said, all these risk factors are kind of long term risk factors we want to help change. If your cholesterol numbers are above 130, again, uh, talk with your physician about thinking about starting a cholesterol medication. Uh, to help decrease the long-term risk. You know, I'm, I'm a firm believer that if, you know, our grandparents and, and others in the past had access to things like cholesterol medications and, and good blood pressure medications, many of them would have lived, you know, a lot longer uh, because these medications do work. Uh, so if you get on the right track, maybe when you're 50, much better chance that when you're 60 and 70, uh, that you're going to be free from a heart attack or a stroke as opposed to starting things when you're 70 years old. Um, you know, we talk about the metabolic syndrome, which is kind of being overweight, having a little high blood pressure, um, a little cholesterol, uh, you know, people say, oh, it's just a little bit elevated doc. Why do I need to really worry about it? 
Uh, I'm sure you've all been there. You've probably been in the doctor's office and the doctor says, ah, your blood pressure is 135 over 85. You're okay. Just kind of keep an eye on it. I think that's where kind of maybe even we as physicians kind of fall um, a little short of, of, of care in a sense that it's hard to make, you know, follow up with patients and, and make them check their blood pressure. In an ideal world, your blood pressure should be, you know, 110 over 70. That's kind of the goal. Um, you know, I don't know how many people that are on the call right now can say that, that their blood pressure is 110 over 70. Hopefully most of you. Um, and if it's not 110 over 70, it's something to think about and talk with your, with your physici physicians about. Um, chronic kidney disease, do not ignore chronic kidney disease. You know, having kidney disease is, increases the risk of having a heart attack and a stroke, you know, fivefold. So, so we worry about our patients who have high blood pressure and kidney disease. Um, if you have things like rheumatoid arthritis or lupus, I know a lot of women that deal with that. Um, you know, again, it's not a uh, thing that you have to be scared about, but something that to be vigilant about and talk with your physician because those kind of diseases increase inflammation in the body. Uh, and that ultimately leads to, you know, that plaque formation we talked about initially. Um, I'll talk a little bit later on about menopause as well uh, as it pertains to this group. But uh, certainly we know that as women go through that menopausal transition, that they are essentially the same as a man in terms of the risk that they have uh, for uh, heart disease. And you may want to talk with your physicians about, you know, lipids and how do you check your cholesterol. You know, there's the basic cholesterol test. There are some other markers such as what we call a CRP or LP little a um, that you see here at the bottom. Uh, those may be some additional lab tests your physicians may want to order after talking with you to find you, you know, how risk, how much of a risk is heart disease for you uh, and your loved ones. There are folks that have, you know, what we call peripheral arterial disease. There are ways to measure for peripheral arterial disease. So if you have significant leg pain, or, or, or swelling in your legs, or if you walk, you know, maybe uh, 100 feet or 200 feet, you start getting cramps in your, in your legs uh, or in your calves. Those may be early signs that you're starting to develop some blockages in the pipes of the heart or, and the pipes of the legs and, and, and everywhere else in the body. So again, speak up with your doctor. There's a quick test in the, in the office that they can do to help assess that. So diets, people always ask me, what's the best diet? Uh, I don't know if, um, I've tried all of these on the left here. I've tried the keto diet. I've tried the plant-based diet. I've done every, you know, all of these things. Um, and right now I'm on time-restricted eating, just so you guys know what I'm doing. Um, the, uh, there is no perfect diet. Um, but if you ask me to tell, you know, say, what's the most evidence-based diet? What's the most researched diet? Uh, the most researched diet is the, the quote-unquote, the Mediterranean diet. You know, there's lots of recipes and things like that. You guys have already, you know, heard about that. Um, the Mediterranean diet is probably the, the most researched diet in the world, and it's shown the most sort of uh, improvement in cholesterol numbers and, and long-term cardiovascular risk. You know, Mediterranean diets, there's nothing special about the Mediterranean diet. You know, you can call it whatever you want, but the, the, the key out of any of these diets is you're eating less processed foods, right? You're eating less of those processed carbohydrate junk in a box whether it's sugar or, or carbohydrates. So, so again, the motto, everything in moderation, right? If I told every one of you guys to don't eat pizza, that's the first thing you're gonna buy on your way home tonight is, is you're gonna get a box of pizza and, and take it home and eat it. Um, I'm never, I never tell my patients not to eat something. I tell them just eat more of this. And what is that? Uh, what I tell patients is eat you know, less processed foods, so more fresh vegetables right, and more lean meat uh, and fish. So the Mediterranean diet focuses mostly on fish and healthy vegetables and fruits uh, and some olive oil, you know, trying to stay away from the processed butters and, and, you know, the cheeses and those kinds of things. And then eat less, eat less, eat less. All of us eat probably way more than we need. Food is everywhere. You know, a million years ago, we had to look for food. Now you can literally drive by, you know, any any road and within 30 seconds, you'll probably hit a, hit a fast food restaurant. So uh, eating less, you know, time restricted eating has been helpful for people. There's no strong evidence to support it, but I've seen personally and, and with patients, you know, I tell people that they, you know, they say, what should I eat? You know, how much should I eat for breakfast? What should I eat for dinner, for a snack, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I've kind of told patients just eat between 12 and six, you know, the rest of the time you can drink water uh, and, and you just eat between 12 and six and you eat mostly vegetables and fruits and, and some lean meats. Uh, and try not to um, shop on the inside of the grocery store. Um, so that's my little word about diets is, is there's a whole lot of diets. You can pick what you want, but the key is 
stay away from processed foods and limit the quantity that you're eating. And if you do eat, you know, um, uh, take out or, or any of those kinds of things, try to try to limit that. And that's really the gist of it, just of the diet. And I just have a slide here that basically shows you that there's less risk with, you know, Mediterranean diets, less risk of a heart attack and stroke as opposed to, you know, the, the regular diet. So um, that's the most evidence we have to support using Mediterranean diet. Just have a slide because I figured I, you guys are sick of hearing me talk. Uh, you know, it's not that diabetes, heart disease, or obesity runs in your family. It's that no one runs in your family. I think that's, that's the problem for a lot of us is, is that, you know, we don't have time to exercise. This is no fault of our own. This is just the society we live in. And, and you know, uh, it's not like I exercise every day and I'm a cardiologist. I see people die from heart disease and, and I still can't motivate myself to exercise every day. Um, so, so I, I think that's where diet is, is even more of an important factor because like I said, you can't outrun the diet that you have. Uh, so not eating as much is, is your way of kind of exercising and hopefully getting to those 10,000 steps, et cetera, uh, is, is, is helpful for people. So how much exercise should you do? Um, you know, I prefer that most people do moderate exercise, you know, um, which would be, you know, brisk walking. That's all you really need. Uh, 30 minutes a day for about five times a week. Don't make this, you know, you don't need fancy gym memberships or virtual online memberships. And I see all these new fancy equipment you can have. There's like mirrors on the wall that people have now, <laughs> and I don't know what those things do, but at the end of the day, all you need to do is walk. Uh, you, you can, you know, uh, just walk around your neighborhood, walk around uh, you know, the track at the school. Um, if you just did brisk walking uh, for 30 minutes, that's more than enough for 90% for of the people. If you wanna do more things, you know, Dr. Cicillo, our, our, our uh, fearless leader here, uh, he does a lot of biking. He does heavy exertional biking. That's great. And I'm not discouraging people from doing that. Please absolutely do that. Um, but uh, I think moderation, right? And again, why is my keyword moderation? It's because you don't have to go out there and run a marathon. Actually, we've seen, you know, there's medical evidence to show that people that do extreme marathons actually have some heart inflammation and heart damage. So, so you know, there's no reason to go out and run a marathon, um, but, but moderation, right? Brisk walk, 30 minutes, that's all you really need. Um, and then, uh, you know, word about blood pressure, as I mentioned, you know, what is a normal blood pressure? 110 over 70. That's your goal. Uh, so we've talked about, you know, diet. We've talked about exercise. We've talked about cholesterol. You, only, you want that LDL number to be as close to 100 or below 100, depending on your risk factors. And now the, you know, the, the most modifiable risk factor in the entire world that controls heart disease is high blood pressure. If we could fix high blood pressure, we would fix, you know, a, a lot of heart disease. And it's a very easy thing to do. Uh, I think if you're 25 years old, you should get your blood pressure checked. I don't think you should wait till you're 40 years old. Uh, I think people should be getting their blood pressure checked actually probably from the time that they're 18, 18 years old. Um, and the pediatricians have been more aware and actually they're checking, you know, people younger than 18 uh, nowadays uh, to, to identify risk factors, especially because obesity has been, you know, more prevalent in, in, in the pediatric population these days. Um, if your blood pressure is not 110 over 70, what do you need to do? Again, this is a long-term thing. That plaque forms over several decades. So you have more than enough time, even now. You know, even I tell even my 60-year-old patients that, hey, reasonably with medications, we can get you to about 80, 85. So it's important for you to think about, you know, getting on medical therapy. So speak with your physician. Most patients can get their blood pressure controlled with one or two medicines. Now, the key is you're doing all the other things. Your diet, you know, your diet is correct and your exercise is correct. If your diet's, you know, picking up McDonald's every day because you're busy, no amount of medicine is going to fix a gaping hole. You know, it's kind of like putting a Band-Aid on a gaping hole uh, without doing the other things, which is, you know, controlling your stress and, and sleeping and those kinds of things. But the ideal blood pressure goal is about 110 over 70. That's what we strive for. Do we get there in every patient? Absolutely not, because there are some side effects. And if you've had side effects with low blood pressure, that's, you know, that's something that you need to speak with the physician about. But um, but certainly we want that. That's the perfect number. You know, everybody wants to know what's, what my number should be, but that's the perfect number. 110 over 70 is kind of where we want it to be. Um, people also have some questions about, you know, what stress test should I get or, or what should I do uh, to figure out if I have heart disease? Um, I just put this slide up here, not to tell you that you're going to need to go, go get all these tests, but, but we have two different ways of, of looking at the heart and, 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 and blockages. One is what we call anatomic testing. That's actually looking at the blood vessel with either a CT scan or what we call a calcium score. Uh, we have that available here at Providence. And, and usually, you know, the calcium score costs about 50 bucks. Uh, and it gives you an idea of, of if you're starting to develop a plaque. 
do you, does everyone need to go out there and get it? No, but if you have some risk factors and you're wondering, hey, you know, you need some motivation, a, a kick in the rear, so to speak, to, to start exercising and, and improve your diet, a calcium score might be a good way to get you there. Uh, it helps us kind of see if you have calcification and buildup of plaque. Um, it doesn't tell me how bad the plaque is. You know, like I said, I remember the original slide I showed you is the plaque on the outside of the blood vessel or is it kind of encroaching on the inside of the blood vessel and kind of pushing the blood vessel down? It's a little hard to tell that uh, with just these, these calcium scores, but it gives you an idea. It gives you a picture. It gives, gives you a little bit of a risk assessment of where you are. Um, again, something for you to talk with your physician about. Then there are what we call functional testing. These tests don't necessarily help us look at the plaque, but they kind of tell us, is the blood kind of getting where it needs to go? Uh, and those things are some of the things that you might've done or seen in the past, like a treadmill stress test or an ultrasound stress test or what we call a nuclear stress test. Um, those tests are mostly indicated for people that are having symptoms. Uh, we don't normally order these tests on people that are asymptomatic, meaning you're doing well, you're walking, you're exercising, you feel well. There's no reason to go out there and get these tests. Uh, because you know tests can tests can have false positives and downstream consequences, so we don't recommend that you get them, you know, for fun. Uh, a lot of you folks might be you know enticed into doing executive physicals uh, that involve these stress tests. You know, I'm a, as a cardiologist, I don't recommend them because because we don't really uh, have any evidence to support routine stress testing on people. So I'd be a little cautious about you know getting random stress tests. Um, but certainly, if you have symptoms, you're more short of breath, you're fatigued, etc. Uh, these are some avenues to be able to assess whether you have heart disease or not. So um, a word about menopause and heart disease. Uh, we know that on average, women hit the menopausal transition um, around the age of 50, you know, some a little sooner, some a little later. Uh, and certainly with those hormonal changes, we do have changes in body composition, your lipids and how you metabolize, you know, the food that you eat. Um, I don't know these symptoms, but I'm told for that people have hot flashes and sleep disturbances and depression and anxiety. And, and yes, I, I'm sure these can be debilitating. And unfortunately, they, these are for some, for some women. Uh, you know, they can't do that the work they need to do. Uh, and along with that, along with those sleep disturbances and, and, and depression, anxiety come increased risk of, of heart disease. So, uh, you know, people tend to uh, gain weight. They decrease their physical activity when this kind of things happen. Um, you know, I've had patients who picked up smoking because they're just, you know, so anxious and, and, and not feeling well. Um, your race and, you know, your ethnicity may have some impact in how, how much menopause affects you uh, in terms of your, you know, your cholesterol and your, and your propensity to have future heart disease. Um, we, as I mentioned, once you go through the menopausal transition, your risk of having heart disease is just as high as a, as a man. So it's important for you to seek out, you know, your physician and, and talk with them. We as physicians do a very poor job, and I've mentioned this before when I've been with you guys about about being aggressive with women. Women tend to get less aggressive care with medications. Women tend to get less aggressive care with uh, procedures. Um, so, so you guys need to advocate for yourself and go to the physician and, and talk with them. Uh, just as a whole, we as a physician community are, are not as aggressive. Uh, with women, maybe because men uh, are more vocal in terms of complaining about their pain. As I said, my wife always makes fun of me when I get a man cold. She says, you know, says I, 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 I do too much whining. But, but, I th but I think women also don't tend to speak up as much. And I think you guys should definitely go and speak with your doctor um, about, you know, that menopausal transition, how it affects you in the long term. Uh, unfortunately, we've not seen any um, long-term benefit with hormone replacement therapy. Some of you may have been on this or are considering this. Um, we don't have any uh, significant data to support use of hormone replacement therapy to prevent heart disease specifically. You know, they do help with those symptoms, those hot flashes and sleep disturbances, but does that lead to change in, you know, any significant heart disease risk? We don't see that quite yet at this point. There may be some data out there in the future, but, but, but nothing at this point. So again, have that conversation with your doctor about you know hormone replacement therapy. There are risks and benefits, but no real benefit from a heart disease standpoint. Uh, down to my last one or two slides here. Uh, COVID and heart disease. Uh, at this point, we don't specifically have any links between coronavirus and heart disease. What I've told my patients who've been concerned, who've had it, who've called me, uh, I've, you know, I've asked them, really, do you have symptoms? You know, if you've recovered, you feel well, I don't think there's anything you need to worry about. I know in the news, there was a lot of concern about young athletes 
uh, and even you know professional football players or anyone else getting COVID and what's happening to their heart? Does everyone need an MRI, et cetera? You know, I think CNN and Fox News, you know, freak everybody out. But but at the end of the day, it, you know, think about coronavirus as a, a another virus. In the past, even well before coronavirus, unfortunately, there were some people, you know, less than one percent of the population, who after a very bad cold had what we call viral cardiomyopathy, where the virus affected their heart. So can coronavirus do that? Yes, it can do that. Is it a common thing? No, it's not, uh, at least so far. You know, anyone that tells you they're an expert on coronavirus is, is lying to you because we're, none of us is an expert on coronavirus. We're all learning as we go along, and it's only been a year. Um, and so we see some issues in the future, maybe, but at this point, I'm not routinely concerned for my patients. If they feel well and they're doing well, uh, we don't need any routine testing. You do not need a stress test after having coronavirus. You don't necessarily need to see a heart doctor, um, as I said, as long as you feel well. But on the other hand, if you have persistent symptoms, you know, you are persistently short of breath or you feel, you know, palpitations or other things that you worry you, then definitely go, go out and seek medical attention, you know, which would be the, what the advice we'd give for anybody. So stay tuned. We're learning. Uh, I think, uh, I know Karen mentioned briefly about vaccines and, and Dr. Sassilla, I'm sure we'll talk to you about that. Uh, you know, I'm a huge proponent of vaccines. I've had my vaccine. Um, you know, it, it's it goes to show you that if doctors are fighting over each other, trying to get some, <laughs> trying to get a treatment, you know, most doctors don't want to get treatments, right? We like to do give treatments, but none of us wants to sign up for those treatments that we're giving to patients because you know they all have risk factors. But in this case, you've seen doctors and everybody else, nurses, uh, lining up to get this and 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 you know showing our guns, so to speak, uh, on social media. Uh, I think vaccines, you know, again, we don't know the long-term consequences, but at this, uh, at this time, uh, from a heart perspective and from a total body perspective, the coronavirus vaccines are extremely safe. Um, and just like anything else in life, uh, you know, there are very, very minimal side effects that people have experienced, but for the most part, everything uh, has gone well, at least for, here, uh, for us here at Providence and for my colleagues across the country uh, that I've talked to. So knock on wood, we'll, you know, hopefully stay that way. Um, and then I, I don't know if this will play. I'll click on this. This was the Elizabeth Banks uh, video I was talking about. I just have the link there. Um, Caitlin, let me know if this plays. Uh, let's see. When I have to OK about 10,000 times, let's see if it works. Um, this is done by the American Heart Association Go Red for Women campaign. Um, I don't know if this will play, but but like I said, you can. <laughs> can you hear that, Caitlin? No. Okay. Is it something that can That's be okay. found on YouTube, Doctor? Because I I yeah, can yeah. pull it up. Yeah, I, I have it right here. Yep. Yeah, if you can pull it up, it's uh it's on YouTube. It's just if you type in "Go Red for Women," just a little heart attack, Elizabeth Banks. Uh, it's a three minute video. Uh, if you want to do that. Um, so while Caitlin tries to pull that up, um, anybody have any questions? I'll stop blabbing because I'm sure you're sick and tired of my voice. So, um. any questions? If not, I have one. Um, I'm just curious. Everybody has been under a tremendous amount of stress, um, and you know our bodies react to stress in various ways. I just was curious if you've had um, people contact you about stress-related symptoms that they think are heart-related symptoms in the past year? And has, have you noticed any trends in that? Because I think everybody's about as stressed out as they can possibly be, and, and our bodies do respond to that. Uh, you know, I have allergies. And, started out like a totally um, normal day. Every time I've had some allergies in my nose, I've freaked out and I thought it was COVID. Uh, so, so everyone, I can understand it. And I'm a physician and I kind of know what happens. So, so I can understand why, how people are feeling tense and, and, and scared. Um, yes, I have seen some increase in, in folks that have sought medical care, uh, because they're worried uh, of COVID and, and what they, you know, that little ache and pain they would have never thought about once, um, kind of has scared them, you know, this time around. Um, and I tell people just go back to the basics, you know, yes, obviously you have to deal with the stress. It's easier said than done. Um, but, but nothing that, that has, you know, necessarily translated into, you know, people having heart disease from too much stress, but, but, um, I, I think the key is, 
being true to yourself. If you really feel symptoms, go speak with somebody. And, and, and I think we as physicians are doing a better job even with doing this virtually. So if you feel more comfortable in your own home, uh, many physicians, including our office, is, is doing virtual visits. And, and so uh, it's something easy to do. Um, and and uh, I would suggest that that's how you should maybe initially start the process is just speaking with your physician. Because most of the time we can be able to tell just from your, you know, what, when we talk to the patient, whether this is something serious you need to come in for or whether you need more tests for. Uh, so that's what I would say is, is um, most people, yes, there are stressed out. I don't think I've not seen that translate into any real disease per se. Uh, but that'd be one thing I've told my patients is just give me a call if you're worried about this. Um, uh, over the last year, that's what I've just said, you know, as, as, I, as I'm learning too, you know, I'm learning and you're learning and we'll do it together. So. Okay. Aylin, okay. That yes, I can, I can play it now if you're ready. Yeah, it's a three minute video. It's kind of funny, but, but it kind of, you know, puts into perspective what we've talked about. So if you want to play it, go ahead. Okay. It started out like a totally normal day. Okay, I'll stop sharing. Okay, move objection deadline to the third line after survey. Oh, I'll stop sharing. This is the What are you doing down there? Did you finish your breakfast? Ow. Don't hit your brother. <laughs> I mean, you have to eat something. Here. Okay, five minutes to carpool. Where's my coffee? You okay, Mom? Oh, I'm fine. Sandwich orders. What do you want? Almond butter and jelly. Spaghetti. Oh, you sure you're okay? I'm fine, sweetie. I am so late. Hey, buddy, how you doing? Oh, so hey, honey. Hmm. You okay? Uh, yeah, I'm fine. You sure? Oh, yeah. Here. Acai, my favorites. Mm. See you guys later. Yeah. Where are your shoes? Put your shoes back on, please. You know, go help your sister. We're going in three minutes. Oh my God, what am I doing? I forgot to cut off the crust. Voila, shoes on, potty if you need it. Honey, get your sister. Okay, get your shoes. Nobody move. I'm getting a dustpan. Oh. Mom. Mm. I think you're having a heart attack. Honey. I look like the type of person who has a heart attack. <laughs> I'm just gonna sit down. <sighs> totally fine. Don't forget to wear the high socks with the shin guards. Forget about the shin guards, Mom. <gasps> Come on, Mrs. Underdog is not gonna wait. to bother you. <laughs> I think I might be having a little heart attack. <laughs> Nothing really, just some nausea, tightening of the jaw, dizziness, shortness of breath, muscle pain, achiness, this terrible pressure in my chest. Oh, really? They can be here in how long? <gasps> Two minutes. Can you make it 10? I thought I had gas. Turns out, I was having a heart attack. Heart disease is the number one killer of American women. So now I take care of my heart and I tell the women in my life to do the same. Sounds great, by the way. That's nice, sweetie, but that's not my heart. That is. <laughs> Make it your mission to save your life and the lives of the women you love. Find out more from the American Heart Association at goredforwomen.org. Thanks for doing that, Caitlin. I appreciate it. Um, you guys can still hear me okay? Yes. Yeah, okay, great. So, you know, I, I just played that, you know, I, I thought it got across the, all the points that, that we've talked about today, you know, paying attention to your symptoms, not ignoring heart attack symptoms and, and you know, taking care of yourself. Um, I feel like, you know, uh, many women can relate to that person in that video, you know, where they're doing everything else uh, all day uh, and then they kind of tend to downplay their symptoms. Uh, so, so please, you know, uh, speak up and, and, and go seek medical attention if you have problems, but um, I'll stop there and, and, and uh, you know, think about the word of the day is moderation. Uh, I really tell my patients about that, uh, you know, 
and uh, whether it comes to diet or exercise or stress or how much work you're doing, uh, everything in moderation kind of solves the problem for 99% of the time. So I'll leave it there and, and just ask, see if you guys have any other questions. Any final questions regarding today? I, um, I, I did think about taking a quick poll to ask if people ate with moderation during the Super Bowl or maybe what they actually ate, uh, pizza wings, that kind of a thing. But I, I think we all have like one day a year where we kind of skip that moderation piece. But overall, good, good, good suggestion. Yeah. So, all right, guys. Well, thanks so much. If you don't have any questions, I'll leave you guys be and uh, you guys may talk to me. Okay. All right. Pat, Thanks I see so Pat's much. on the phone there. Pat, how are you? Good to see you. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. And we'll see everybody back um, again on March 24th for our next program. Thanks so much. Thank Bye -bye. you.